So the last talk of the session is by uh, Dr. Stanislav Schwarzman. Uh, he's a professor of chemical and biological engineering in the Genome Institute at uh, Princeton University. And he will talk about data-driven models of embryogenesis. So first of all, thank you, Ute, for organizing yet another fantastic meeting. Um, uh, Bob Weinberg told you yesterday not to trust people who do modeling, and if they shake their hand, uh, you should check the number of your fingers. So the, the difference here is that we model our own data, so I'm going to shake my own hand. I still have five fingers on both uh, hands, right? That doesn't mean that you still have your wallets, but nevertheless, I'll tell you about the stuff that we have been doing. All right, so uh, this drawing here is a drawing by George Gamow, one of the most colorful uh, characters of the 20th century science, both in life sciences and in physics. So this is a drawing from his popular science book uh, that's called One to Three Infinity that was written originally for his son and eventually for uh, boys and girls all around the world. And um, uh, the main idea of the book is that um, uses many... Uh, yeah, so that uses many examples from burning candles and the inclined planes and deflating balloons, is that um, if you are aware of the laws of physics, and if you write your equations right and you're fortunate enough uh, to solve them, then you can think um, about progressively and increasingly complex problems. And somewhere towards the end of the book, after examples of discharging batteries and flames, examples of biological systems appear. So there are cells, there are embryos, and uh, this drawing from 1947 is a challenge to uh, the future genera generations of scientists. And it's a challenge to provide causal uh, explanation of development. And this is something that was uh, at the heart of uh, uh, Davidson's research program, uh, David, the same Davidson who was at the origins um, of this conference. So, and one of the first things that Eric would uh, say in his talks is that dogs give rise to dogs and frogs give rise to frogs. So there is a great deal of determinism and there is a great deal of um, reproducibility. And indeed, uh, if you watch the entire program, you first go through the exponential increase in the number of cells. Then th there is increase in the diversity of the cells. Then there is uh, morphing, then there is a change in scale, and morphing of sheets uh, starts uh, on the way to the formation of complex organs. Then there is growth, and then uh, we have something that we can recognize either as a human or as a dog or as a frog. Okay? So this process is as repeatable and as uh, reliable in many cases when it is reliable and repeatable as a burning candle, as a discharging battery, as a ball rolling down an inclined plane. So what is it that we miss to explain how things are happening? And something that was at the heart, so this was a challenge in 1947. This remains a challenge more than 70 years later. And something was at the heart of Eric's program is that we can understand a lot about the system if we really um, zoom in and bury into the transcriptional networks. But of course, there are things beyond transcription. There are post-transcriptional modifications. There are post-translational modifications. There is metabolism. So it is difficult because in the process of embryogenesis, we constantly need to change focus and think at different points in time and different points in space on different processes. We do need to think about metabolism because constructing an embryo or constructing a soul costs uh, energy. We do need to think about um, uh, transcriptional networks, and we do need to think about the organization of transcriptional networks in space. We do need to think about how all of it feeds into cell cycle, because in the end we have to construct these cells. We do need to think about mechanical forces, because everything develops inside envelopes, and you need to respect and fight against the spatial constraints. So, but never, so this is something that we would like to understand, and this is something that provides uh, an endless source of uh, beautiful puzzles and problems for all of us who are thinking about embryos, not only when we think about our kids or kids of our relatives, but when we come um, into our labs. Okay, so this is, of course, drawing of something that um, resembles human development. This is a drawing by a graduate student in my lab that summarizes the first uh, three hours of development um, in a fruit fly. So in the system, even though that this is not a human, we do have an exponential increase uh, in the number of cells. And in the two hours, we construct 2 to the 13th number of cells, putting any unicellular organism to shame by the speed of its development. We do form an initially unpatterned tissue, which is an epithelium. We do subdivide this epithelium into three germ layers. And we do begin to deform this epithelium to form different structures. And, and these structures even begin to undergo epithelial to mesenchymal transition, some of the things that we have already uh, mentioned in this talk. So today, I will, tell, I will take you through four short stories 
that will tell you how we begin combining models at different scales, models of metabolism and models of the cell cycle and models of pattern formation and models of morphogenesis, trying to understand how we go from a single uh, totipotent fertilized cell to the organism, to, to the system that has thousands of cells that begins to morph itself into the shapes that we can begin recognizing as things that are similar to our own organs. Okay, so let's start with the first uh, step in this process and this is the process of an exponential increase in the number of cells because to build a multicellular organism you need, to, you need to have lots of cells so that you can work with them, you can make them different and you can assemble them into different structures and shapes. Okay, so first we'll go in the process of conversion of one cell to many and this is the work of the fantastic graduate student in my lab, Yong Hyung Song, who was a graduate student who is now uh, doing postdoc in statistical mechanics in Korea. Um, it, this is together with uh, Rob Marbion and Josh Rabinovitz, uh, who is uh, my neighbor and colleague in the Genomics Institute in Princeton and Eric Jabrian uh, is another uh, postdoc. All right. So what you're looking at here, let me see if this please, is um, uh, a movie uh, of a Drosophila embryo. So at this point it is um, between one and two hours and you're watching an exponential increase in cell numbers. So this is a Ferrari of uh, cell cycles and uh, cell divisions are about initially six to ten minutes apart. So this is a relatively large genome but it divides much much faster uh, than a bacterium and in a matter of two hours it goes through 13 divisions constructing approximately 6,000 cells. So if you calculate 2 to the 13th, it's more than 6,000, but I, I can explain to you where the difference is coming from. It's not uh, important here. Okay. Uh, the most important thing to understand at this stage of development is that this is largely an autonomous system. Okay. So at this point, you just have an egg that is surrounded by membranes and an eggshell, and the only thing that comes into this embryo is oxygen. The only thing that leaves it to the extent that we know is CO2. Everything else is happening inside. This is not a weird system because it's an insect. Because if you think about a human pre-implantation embryo, it looks exactly like this. Before the embryo started communicating with the mother, it's on its own, it is surrounded by its membranes, and it does what it has to do only relying on maternal supplies, increasing the number of cells and increasing their diversity. So let us first watch these cell cycles. We understand exactly what is happening here. Every one of these green dots is a nucleus. Every time we double the number of nuclei, so it's a very complex process. We have cell cycle networks, we have metabolic networks, but there is one chemical reaction that we understand in great detail. We double the genome. This is the genome, the sequence of which we know. We know exactly what we have done every time. We, we know the sequence of A, T's, G's and C's and we can calculate how many monomers we need to string together to produce this specific um, polymer. So one of the first things, one of the things that actually started this project is that we realized, so it's a very, very fast cell cycle. Because it is so fast, it stands to reason that the mother would deposit all the DNTPs, monomers, that you need to synthesize these 2 to the 13th genome, genomes in uh, uh, two hours. Okay. It turns out, to our great surprise, that the mother deposits only a third of what you need to synthesize the genomes. Okay? Which means that the rest of DNTPs needs to be synthesized on the go. Okay? And this immediately led to two questions. How do you synthesize the rest? And why don't you deposit another two thirds, even though you develop an egg for three days and you have plenty of time to load it with everything that it needs? So it turns out that if you flip to the end of the biochemistry textbook, that there is a rate limiting enzyme in the synthesis of DNTPs. It's called ribonucleotide reductase. The embryo, so the embryo does everything up until this rate limiting step and the mother needs to catalyze this one reaction. There is another one, which is a phosphorylation of um, DNTPs to DNTPs, but this is not rate limiting. So there is this enzyme and this enzyme synthesizes the rest two thirds of monomers that you need to synthesize the genomes that will, you will then be differentiating and making into different cell types in the embryo on the go. So how do we prove it? We prove it because uh, the early fly embryo is a wonderful experimental system which we can manipulate genetically, we can watch in live movies. It is also large enough, it's about half a millimeter long. Uh, uh, we can inject drugs into it we, in, in this part, and we can watch what is happening in response to the injection of this drug. So in this particular experiment, Young injected um, hydroxyurea, which is an inhibitor of ribonucleotide reductase. And when he does this, the embryo stops and does not complete the 13 uh, obligate divisions. 
On the other hand, when he injects exactly the same amount of poison and a cocktail of DNTPs at high concentration, the embryo doesn't care, goes through the right number of divisions, goes on to hatch as if nothing happened. Okay, so this way we know that this enzyme is essential and this way we know that we synthesize the shortage on the go simultaneously with development. So we are carrying out cell cycle concurrently with the rate limiting step for the monomer that is necessary to do the business end of the, of the large scale anabolic process that cell cycle actually controls. All right. So ribonucleated reductase uh, is an absolutely fascinating uh, enzyme. So at some point we lived in the RNA world when both information storage and catalysis were done by exactly the same type of molecule, which was RNA. At some point we had to uh, evolve uh, more stable information storage systems. So we had to invent DNA and we also had to invent smarter uh, enzymes. So we had to invent protein based enzymes. And at this point we had to generate DNA and ribonucleotide reductase evolved. So this enzyme evolved and it is highly conserved all the way from bacteria to us. It is a highly regulated enzyme because uh, this enzyme can at any given point process any one of the four possible substrates and convert it into the four possible products. Okay. And it is absolutely critical to control the activity of this enzyme and the selectivity of this enzyme. Because when the activity is too low, you run out of uh, monomers for synthesis of DNA, and this is one of the ways in which we kill cancer cells by giving them uh, hydroxyurea. If the activity is too high and the pools will be too high, we might accidentally incorporate the wrong uh, uh, base during the synthesis of DNA, and this is how we accumulate mutations. If the pools are imbalanced, we will also accumulate mutations. So this, the acti this is why the, both the rate at which the enzyme is working and the selectivity of its uh, production is highly controlled. How does this happen? So first of all, there is an active site where the actual reduction is happening, but there are also two allosteric sites. One allosteric site is controlling specificity. So at this point, four different molecules can bind, and depending on what binds, the flexible loop that extends from this uh, uh, specificity site uh, to the active site changes its shape this way or that way to accept one of the four possible um, substrates. At the same time, there is also an activity site that tells you at which rate you are synthesizing whatever the, the, uh, is it that you are synthesizing at any given time. So at this activity site, ATP can bind. When the levels of energy in the cell are high, everything is good, we can go on to synthesize DNA. On the other hand, DATP, which is chemically quite and structurally quite similar to ATP, can also bind there. And when the levels of DATP are too high, this is a master switch and you can shut the activity of the enzyme down. So you understand the DATP is one of the products of the synthesis of uh, uh, the process. So in this way, the system can self-inhibit it itself. And what you need to realize is that there is a lot of complexity at the level of a single enzyme. We are not talking about a network. We are not talking about an enhancer where multiple uh, transcription factors bind recruiting or modifying components of the basal transcription machinery. This is regulation that is purely at the level of biochemistry. How do we know that uh, some of the, these uh, um, arrows that can positively or negative, uh, negatively control the system are actually working in the embryo? In exactly the same way that we injected hydroxyurea in embryos, Young injected DATP and this stops cleavage cycles dead uh, in their tracks. On the other hand, when exactly the same amount of DATP comes as a part of a cocktail of DNTPs, the embryo doesn't care, completes the cleavages, goes on to, to hatch. So based on this, which are our own data, <laughs> we can formulate the following model for the dynamic control of DNTP synthesis in embryos. So in this model, we will have an abundant substrate, which are NDPs. We know that it's abundant because we measured absolute levels of NDP, which are precursors for the synthesis of DNTPs. We have the monomers, so M stands for the monomer, this is the precursor for DNA synthesis, and we have the enzyme, which is RNR in this case. So we can write uh, a very simple model for the synthesis and uh, withdrawal of DNTPs and embryos. On the left hand side we have the rate of change of DNTP, of, of DNTP concentration. This is the function of withdrawal. So we know exactly how this function looks like because we can watch nuclear divisions. We know exactly how much we need at every nuclear division and we know exactly the timing of these cycles and we know precisely that after every one of the nuclear divisions next time we will need twice as much. On the uh, the, the other term on the right hand side, this is the maximal rate of synthesis. 
We know that the system works in the zeroth order regime with respect to the uh, NDPs based on the measurements that we have done in vitro. And on the bottom, we have allosteric inhibition by DATP. And th so the form of these expressions comes from experiments that were done many years ago, largely by the Swedish school who dissected how this enzyme uh, is working um, at the molecular level. So this is the work of Peter Reichardt. And then we have the initial condition, which is the amount of DNTP that was deposited by the mother. So the overall design principle of the system is as follows. So you have a parent. This parent gives you uh, an endowment, right? So it doesn't give you everything that you need. At the same time, it gives you means to synthesize the rest. But this enzyme and this, these means are inhibited by the initial endowment. Then you burn through, the, through, through, through this endowment, through the, through the inheritance, you lift the inhibition of ribonucleotide reductase and you begin synthesizing DNTPs supplying the exponentially multiplying genomes by exactly the same amount of DNTP that you need. Okay, we have this model. It is simple because we wanted to have a small number of parameters and we can constrain these parameters mathematically. So there are uh, three, this is a three dimensional parameter space because the model is as simple as something that you would see in a homework in a chemical kinetics class. We can scan the three dimensional parameter space in a matter of a couple of minutes and identify a very nice region in a three dimensional parameter space where the enzyme does not run out, where the embryo does not run out of DNTPs and hit zeros before 13 divisions, and where the predicted concentration traces do not take you outside of the error bars of your measurements. So, uh, this is the normal course. So, first of all, the level of DNTPs uh, in the embryo would increase as a function of time. Why do they increase as a function of time? Because you uh, eat through the maternal supply and you lift the inhibition and you start synthesizing and this is why the concentration is increasing. Eventually it will start decreasing because uh, the exponential withdrawal function will um, overrun the linearly increasing or sub-exponentially increasing uh, production rate. Okay, so one of the most uh, uh, intuitive predictions of this model is that for very large range of initial concentrations you will converge to exactly the same concentration at the beginning of the third hour. So it makes sense. If you have parents that are poor, you will become independent sooner and you will start synthesizing uh, DNTPs on your own sooner or earning your own money sooner. If your parents give you a lot, you will be dependent on them for a longer period of time and your enzyme will not work for a longer period of time. One way or the other, something like this can be proved mathematically because this is a single non-autonomous differential equation and by looking at the variational um, equations around the time-dependent trajectory, you can prove that you converge to this point. So this is a prediction of the model. Uh, but the embryo is a good enough of experimental system that th this prediction can be tested experimentally. In particular, Young injected Con different concentrations of DNTPs at, uh, for embryos that were between zero and one hour old. So at this time, the embryo has gone through only a couple of uh, cell cycles. It won't make a difference in the measurements. And all of them collapse to exactly the same concentration by the beginning. So this is a, the process that tells you how we are synthesizing the building blocks that are needed to construct the genomes that will eventually will be used by cells that construct the embryo. Okay, so this is uh, so another way to test the model is that because this is the fly, we have a wealth of genetic manipulations available to us, and because so we can uh, express in these flies the version of the enzyme from which the neg which is insensitive to negative feedback loops. So this enzyme is highly conserved, and you can make just a single nucleotide change that will uh, um, convert uh, aspartate to asparagin. And this single amino acid substitution will make the enzyme completely insensitive to the negative feedback loop. When we express the wild type version of the enzyme in embryos, the concentration of DNTPs change by a factor of two and three. So these are absolute measurements of metabolite concentration by um, small molecule mass spec. On the other hand, when we express the enzyme that is insensitive to um, ne negative feedback inhibition, the concentrations change by an order of magnitude and all of the embryos die. And there is uh, now, so this way you know that not only that the system is working this way, that it has to work this way. What is the reason that the system evolved to this state? Why not deposit more? So it turns out that uh, you need to think what is it that these synthesized genomes are doing. You're synthesizing so that not only you can watch the cells and count cells, eventually you want to start reading these genomes and transcribing them. And if you think about it, you will realize that synthesis of DNA, which is the process of making DNA, and transcription, which is the process of reading the DNA, are 
structurally and chemically incompatible processes. And there is a conflict of giants in the nucleus, which is the conflict between DNA polymerase and RNA polymerase, which requires that, they, that these cell cycles that increase the number of cells in the embryo eventually slow down so that you have time to read the genomes that you have just synthesized. So if we now, um, oops, how do I go back? Yep. Okay, so this is what is happening in normal embryos. So you go through uh, 13 cell cycles, and uh, cell cycle number 11 is about six minutes long. Cell cycle number 12 is about nine minutes long. And cell cycle number uh, 13 is about 14 minutes long. In embryos where the levels of DATP are too high, so these are cell cycles that fail to slow down. They are not faster. They just do not, they do not become slower. There is no change in cell cycle number nine. There is a slight uh, uh, shortening of the cell cycle number. Uh, so, th so, so, this is um, so this is 11, uh, 12 becomes slightly shorter, and, and cell cycle 13 becomes noticeably shorter. This shortening is enough to kill the embryo. The fact that cell cycles did not slow down. So why does this happen? It turns out that in these cell cycles, you do not manage to accumulate enough zygotic transcripts that are needed to cellarize the embryo, make the epithelium, and then pattern the epithelium. So how do we know this? We know this because in embryos that are either normal or in embryos that have elevated levels of DNTP, we can measure transcription at a single cell level using the MS2 uh, reporters for early expressed genes. So this is an expression in a single nucleus. Because it's a beautiful system that gives us hundreds of nuclei in a single frame that we can track over time, we can construct, a, we can take an integral under this curve. This integral is a measure of transcriptional output of a single nucleus. We can construct a histogram of transcriptional output of the entire embryo, and we know that when in embryos where the cell cycles are shorter, the time windows for active zygotic transcription are also shorter, so embryos uh, have reduced transcriptional output. And as a consequence, they start to gastrulate, but then go through major mor morphogenetic defects. This is something that I don't want to describe. So this is an example that shows you that in the early stages of, of embryogenesis, a core metabolic process controls the duration of a core cell biological process, which is the cell cycle, which eventually controls transcription, which is something that has to happen in every one of these embryos. This is why Mod developing models of embryogenesis is hard. And the model that we have is an admittedly a Mickey Mouse model, but it, it shows how you can use uh, an experimental system that yields itself to live imaging, pharmacological perturbations, and genetic manipulations to start thinking about processes that are not just transcription, that are not just cell cycle, that are not just metabolism, but that everything together. Okay. Uh, the other thing that you need to think about uh, in early embryos is that to pattern them, you need to place all of these cells somehow in space. You need to, or in the same way, when you construct any given tissue, you need to construct the nodules in all of our organs. So how cells are packed in space is quite important. And if you think about the early worm embryo, there everything is packed with, it has to be packed just so, right? And if you think about the early fly embryo, it's a different type of packing. And if you think about any animal, it's a different type of packing. So what is the spatial packing and distributions of cells that will be eventually patterned. So this is something that we ask in the second story. And this is the work of Sayant and Data, a graduate student in my lab, Matej Kreins, a former postdoc who now has his own lab in Slovenia, and Sal Torquata, who is a statistical uh, mechanics expert and my colleague in the chemistry department at Princeton. All right. Okay, so if you look at, uh, so th these are once again these beautiful uh, syncytial divisions in the embryo. And these are the packings of nuclei at the nuclear densities that, that double with every nuclear division. So you can look at this packing and you can ask, well, how are these things packed in space? So it's not periodic, it's not completely random. So is there structure? And there is a way to think about it. So this is an example of a purely man-made system where you have an assembly of colloidal particles that increase in density. And you can ask yourself, how is the, are both of these systems packed in space? Well, uh, statistical mechanics and, uh, gives you a way, and the theory of liquids gives you a way to think about packing of these objects. You walk into a such disordered system, you grab a randomly placed nucleus, you draw circles around it, you count the number of nuclei in any given circle, uh, circle and you divide it by the radius of the ring. And then you plot something that's called pair correlation functions that tells you the probability to find a nucleus 
at a given distance from any randomly chosen test nucleus. So because these nuclei do not overlap, the probability of finding something at a distance of just one diameter will be zero. And then eventually, you will be finding nuclei. So when the system is completely disordered, eventually, no matter where you're going to place your test particle, you will find the nucleus with some probability. On the other hand, if the system is uh, crystalline or polycrystalline, there will be well-developed peaks. And this is the basis of X-ray crystallography. And this is a system with a short-ranged order. So what is it that we have in the early fly embryo? So in the early fly embryo, it turns out that we have something that looks as a system with a short-range order, where there are correlations in nuclear positions at the distances of about two nuclear diameters, that not much uh, more than that. Furthermore, it turns out that if you rescale these pair correlation functions by uh, square root of two, which is the average distance that is uh, shortening with every nuclear division, you will find out that the system behaves in approximately self-similar way, which means that these pair correlation functions collapse. And this approximately self-similar behavior is a signature that allows us to build a computational model for packing of nuclei in the system. Why do we need a model to pack nuclei in the system? Because eventually we want to model pattern formation in it. And we want to model pattern formation on a field of nuclei that should have something in common with the field of nuclei that we observe in the real embryo. So uh, the model that we proposed, and that, so we went through a number of iterations of these models. The one that uh, was eventually useful is a model where nuclei repel at short distances very, very strongly, and that have a soft repulsion uh, shoulder that has a finite range. And the, and the range of this, short ra of this um, soft repulsion is getting shorter and shorter with every nuclear division because nuclei repel as a consequence of cytoskeletal crowns that they're surrounded with. And these crowns become shorter and shorter because you run out of monomers that you construct around nuclei. So uh, if you rescale this model, it turns out that it has only two dimensionless parameters. And it turns out that you can identify these parameters uniquely based on the live imaging data that allow you to track structure factors and pericorrelation functions through nuclear divisions. So this is an example of uh, uh, artificial embryo that has the aspect that is approximated by a prolate spheroid that has geometric parameters of the real embryo that is now being packed with nuclei that, that are of exactly the same number as nuclei in the real embryo that are packed with correlation functions that look like correlation functions of the real embryo. So now this field of nuclei gives us a canvas on which we can play out pattern formation. And we can, in, in, in languages of Shalevstok, zonate the embryo and uh, control gene expression as a function of time and space by morphogen gradients that have been studied for more than a quarter century in the system. So now I'll tell you two very short stories because most of this has been published. It is just now we can play out these models on embryos as a function of space and time with nuclei, which uh, have something to do with the packing of real nuclei. OK, so um, this is a side view of the real embryo. And this is the expression of three genes. So the blue gene is called decapentaplegic. So this is the fly's version of bone morphogenetic protein. The red gene is called short gastrulation. So this is the. Um, fly's version of cordin. And the green gene is called the snail, which is a fly's version of snail, right? And uh, so the green gene marks the population of cells that in the fly will form the muscle. The red gene marks uh, the cells that in the fly uh, form will form the neurogenic ectoderm. And the blue gene marks the cells that will form the skin of the embryo. So for people who have seen these pictures for ages, this will not be surprising. For those of you who are seeing it for the first time, I want you to appreciate just how sharp is the boundary between the green cells and the red cells. There is not a single yellow dot in this image. So this is really uh, yes or no. And in this system, largely through the work of Mike Levine and his academic progeny, we understand quite a lot about the nature of this zonation in the system. But in this system, it's called patterning. OK, so uh, this system and uh, these uh, black shadows here are the nuclei that we know how to place on the embryo using this model with nuclear repulsions and exponential increase in the number of cells that comes from live imaging data. So the origin of this pattern in the system is very well understood. There is a gradient of uh, uh, NF-kappa-B transcription factor that was discovered in 1989 by three simultaneous papers by Ruth Stewart, uh, Christian nussmann volhardt and uh, Mike Levine. So this is a graded distribution of a transcription factor that is uh, called in flies called dorsal. Uh, we call it uh, nuclear uh, NF-kappa-B. So this is not a concentration gradient, but this is a gradient of nuclear localization. In the bottom of the embryo, dorsal is found in the nuclei. In the top of the embryo, it is found largely in the cytoplasm. In the middle of the embryo, uh, 
there is a uh, uh, intermediate regime, and this was one of the favorite gradients for Eric Davidson to argue about. Okay, so uh, in this system, there is dorsal. Dorsal is a DNA binding transcription factor. It can act both of the uh, both as an activator and as a repressor. It controls its target genes both directly and indirectly through relatively uh, simple feedforward and uh, network um, feedforward network motifs that can establish uh, gene expression patterns that look like um, bands and th that look like lateral stripes on both sides of the embryo. And by controlling the number of dorsal sides and then controlling the number of cofactors that work together with dorsal, you can control the width of, of these stripes. It, I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. Okay. So now what we can do, we can use models for the, so we can use live imaging data for the formation of the dorsal gradient. We can use measurements of the spatial profile of dorsal, and we can use the time-dependent measurements of the concentration of dorsal together with relatively simple mathematical models of, of how we know the nf -B, uh, system is working to formulate models of the dorsal gradient formation on embryos that have the shape of the real embryos, that have the number of nuclei of the real embryos, and have the packing properties of the real embryos. Okay, and the final uh, story will be the shortest one. So this is the system. We have a convex uh, prolate spheroid that has been patterned in under an hour, establishing the expression patterns of more than a thousand genes that have been studied using multiple techniques, multiplex fluorescent acetyl hybridization, single cell RNA sequencing. So this is probably the system where we know the most about pattern formation in space and time. Okay, it, it, about one hour of the existence of this system. The reason for patterning of the system is that these patterns specify not only cell types, but they control cell movements. And I w want to play the movie of several of the morphogenetic events. So, this, so these are light sheet um, imaging movies that were obtained by Celia Smith, a graduate student from my lab, the one who made uh, the modern version and simplified version of the gamma figure. So what you're watching here, so this is the ventral view of the embryo, this is the dorsal view of the embryo, and this is the cross section. So first of all, you form this furrow. You see this furrow in the form of this dynamically forming omega. This is the part of the embryo that undergoes the epithelial to mesenchymal transition. So these cells express these green genes, twist and snail. You see a fold here, you see a fold here, and eventually this sheet begins to fold, and also parts of the embryo begin to extend. So this is a combination of deformations out of plane of the epithelium and within the plane of the epithelium as a consequence of convergence extension movement. So we are only getting close to modeling the systems. Most of the models of the systems are not to be trusted because even though we do a lot of these models, because they're based on completely empirical or um, ad hoc energy functions that tell you that the state of epithelium at any given point can be computed as, a as an algebraic function of the geometry of the system that tells you that every single cell wants to be of a certain area and every edge costs you energy. This is something that describes a flat epithelium composed of polygons, but one can also extend these models to epithelia built of prisms. So these models are wrong and they're hard to solve. So this is like a joke from the Woody Allen movie that the food, that the food is horrible and the portions are tiny. Yeah. <laughs> Nevertheless, Using these models, one can try to impose two-dimensional patterns of gene expression in the shells constructed from model epithelia that are constructed either from polygons or from prisms. And one can construct primitive uh, invaginations, the ones that look like invaginations uh, in the sea urchin embryo, and the ones that can begin resembling invaginations in the early fly embryo. So uh, this is it. This is the picture of the lab. And um, all of it started mo more than 20 years ago through my collaboration with Trudy Schubach, with whom we advised uh, my first graduate students. And I want to acknowledge other collaborators in Princeton, especially uh, Josh Rabinowitz. Thank you very much. We have 10 minutes for questions. Thanks, Stas. Uh, very nice. Um, you called, the title of your lecture was Data-Driven yeah. Embryogenesis. Models of Embryogenesis, that's yes, right. Yes, yes. Um, I saw a lot more than data. I mean, what, what else drove your research? Uh, personal greed? I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> no, no, it, it, no, 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 it, it's, it's, um, okay, so first of all, you a need... A lot of hypotheses? Yeah, yeah, so, yes, absolutely, so... It's a basic biochemistry and basic statistical physics, uh, mechanics. So embryogenesis, when I started coming to um, uh, Eric's talks, 
in the beginning of 2000s, right? And when I started talking to him and I would hear the same things again and again and again, I understood that he was absolutely fascinating with um, explaining what makes this program so robustly unfolding. And uh, yes, it's a program. Yes, it is encoded by the genome. And the genome ensures that the dog does not become, become a frog. But the, there is no program in a genome to control the position of every specific hair follicle on your skin. So you need to think about the differential contributions of instructions that are rigidly encoded in the genome and instructions that appear through self-organizing or physics-based mechanisms where you don't need to dictate every, every single step. And uh, it is this question that largely drove uh, the fascination. And uh, the books by uh, Gamov, since I was reading them since you know, I, I was a teenager, so these books tell, tell you that if you study uh, at school, you will be able to understand why uh, pools freeze and why candles burn and why batteries discharge. So the question is, what is it that we're missing to understand the systems? I don't think we're missing uh, fundamental laws, but these are the systems of much greater complexity than anything that we ever dealt with. So these are dynamical systems that where the number of variables is changing as a function of time. We are not used to, to thinking about the systems. I think that we need to draw concepts that are not only from physical chemistry and engineering. We need ideas from computer science. We don't at this point exactly know what we need. But it, from studying model systems like uh, Eric's favorite sea urchin or the other Eric's favorite uh, Drosophila embryo, we can, uh, b by working in, with systems where data are plentiful and where images are beautiful, we stand a chance, you know, answering some of the questions that were posed by Gamov and by Davidson and by Vichaus. Yeah. 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 You know, when I looked at your uh, last uh, slide, it, uh, it occurred to This me. one. Yeah, this, this one, mm -hmm. uh, on the left side. Mm -hmm. that if I could, oh, I, uh, can you hear me? Everyone, everyone can hear me. <laughs> uh, uh, it occurred to me that if I, if I make a movie of, uh, uh, of the de development of a phone and uh, uh, project it backwards, then, then I get something like that. Develop of a foam. Yes. Absolutely. So these models that uh, are not to be trusted in any way, shape or form, so these vertex models, they come from models of foam development. Yeah. So the, ab absolutely. It is just in foams, we know that we're talking about surface tensions yeah. and uh, Laplace's law and pressures. Yeah. Here we have absolutely no idea what we're talking yeah. about. It's just in, in, in absolutely. Uh, diminish the number, number of cells, yeah. and then you go the other, the other way. You're absolutely right. But these are the foam bubbles with brains. Yeah. And the brains are genomes that yeah. can control the you know, surface area. So these are very smart bubbles. Yeah. Uh, you didn't tell us where the uh, ribonucleotide triphosphate came from in the egg. Are from the right? mother. From the mother. All maternal. It's all maternal. It's not limiting. So it, there's an excess of the Absolutely. DNA. Yes. And there's no uh, requirement to generate any new biosynthetic DNA. At this point, no. So, so what, what you do, is, so the, the development is very fast. And uh, in 24 hours, you're already hatching. And uh, the reason for hatching is very simple, is that you have to eat. You need to, so you, you run through everything that uh, uh, the mom gave you. And you need to go and fend for yourself. And this is why the larva is the, is the thing that, that has elaborate nervous system and it can sniff out uh, things in the food. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you will you'll trace this, of course, to Angelo Stathopoulos, but um, I, I understand that the degree... I have no idea who you're talking yeah. about. Right, yeah. no, I know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the degree to which the dorsal mm -hmm. protein yeah. actually nuclearizes yeah. in these waves mm -hmm. um, during the initial uh, cleavages, mm -hmm. it seems to me that she's finding that it, by image analysis, that it seems to have a kind of a ratchet Absolutely, later, yeah. And it gets higher and higher. So are your new models, you, you basically showed us you have models, but you didn't tell us what they explained that wasn't explained. Okay, before. so at this point, we do, not, we do not use these models to model transcription. At this point, we have models of the dorsal gradient itself. And uh, Angela is absolutely right that it ratchets. And I think one of the key questions mm -hmm. and the... Uh, 
is when is it that you start reading this gradient? And uh, we are not asking this question for, so for at least one of the genes, one of the targets of the dorsal gradient for wind D, which is something that's expressed at the outskirts of the AP axis, we know that the expression starts at cycle 12. So uh, yeah, it, it's a system where everything, but, but what, what I want to emphasize is that just how many things you need to think to, uh, to, 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 to model this embryo. So for dorsal, it's, it's, it's phosphorylation of uh, cactus and nuclear import and nuclear divisions and, uh, and cell cycle and, and God knows what else. And we need all of it probably to, to get it right. To, and to get it right, meaning that to predict the mutants. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so let's thank Professor. Yeah.